everyone, and welcome to another Discovery Speaker Series. My name is Clarissa. I'm the Program and Volunteer Coordinator for the Puget Sound Estuarium. And we run this program, Discovery Speaker Series, so that we can have scientists, artists, earth advocates, and educators come and share about their projects or their current work to a broader audience. Today, we have some Earth advocates coming to you to talk about water quality in Olympia. So to get some things out of the way, um, you can comment below in the Facebook Live with any questions you have during the presentation, and we will get to them at the very end. You can also download a coloring page to go along with this presentation about water quality if you need something to do while listening in. So this week, we have those Earth Advocates from Marshall Middle School to talk about their water quality research that they've been working on, as well as some other restoration projects around Olympia. We will also have South Sound Green, a nonprofit here in Olympia that is focused on connecting community and schools for watershed protection. So after all of that rain that we just had, we're gonna learn about how it affects our water quality. So if Marshall Middle School could turn on their cameras and audio, we can get started with our presentation. All right, well, good evening, everybody who's tuned into this Facebook feed. It's an honor to be here. My name is Matthew Philippi, and I am a science teacher at the Citizen Science Institute, which is a magnet program hosted at uh, Thurgood Marshall Middle School here on the west side of Olympia. Uh, I've been teaching for 17 years. I'm a graduate of Evergreen State College, and uh, I love all things water. So when I started teaching, one of the big things I want to do is get my kids connected with uh, rivers and estuaries and just anything having to do with the water. Um, and obviously being able to do water quality testing is a great way to connect our kids to our watersheds and help them learn all about different scientific testing processes. And it's just a lot of fun. And um, we've been doing this water quality testing for, I believe the last seven years now. And uh, we have adopted the, the Chutes River right there at Tum Water Falls Park. And when we do our water quality testing, I take my students out and they do all kinds of different stuff and they'll talk about that tonight. And uh, we go out twice a year, once in the fall and once in the winter. And then they analyze their data and they go to the Evergreen State College for a really cool thing called Green Congress that you'll learn about later. Uh, unfortunately, at Green Congress this uh, year uh, will not be live, uh, and the last two years it's been put on hold because of the pandemic, but we're hoping it'll be up and running again next year. Uh, but we still went out and collected our data, and we're going to present that stuff to you tonight. So I'm really honored to have uh, four of my rock star students come out here tonight when they you know, could be doing other stuff. They're here presenting uh, water quality to you guys, so I give all of you guys extra credit and uh, much love. Thank you for being here. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Haley, Jade, Jonah, and Ian, and they'll introduce themselves and they'll talk all about uh, water quality testing and the efforts that our program has been putting together to help uh, restore our local watersheds. Okay, so hi, I'm Haley. I'm in eighth grade and I've been in CSI for three years. Hello, I'm Jonah. I'm 13. This is my first year in CSI and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Ian. I've been in CSI for two years and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Jade. I'm in eighth grade. I've been in CSI for three years. These are our teachers, Mr. Philippi and Mr. Condon. They use field investigations to help connect students in the CSI program with their community and their environment. 
Okay, so what is water quality monitoring? Water quality monitoring is how we determine the health of a body of water, such as a stream, wetland, pond, lake, or ocean. When we perform the test, we measure physical characteristics, chemical makeup, and the health of the organisms that live here. We are using stamina as a guideline for what the water quality should be. Why do we monitor? Humans are dependent on fresh water for many things, including drinking, recreation, uh, animals have to use it, and citizen, science, citizen scientists are essential for helping maintain and improve the water quality throughout the world. So if we find something that's wrong with the water quality, such as the pH is too high and it's killing a lot of the animals, we can help we can help find that problem and quickly fix it so we don't lose those habitats. Monitoring helps us inform, helps inform us about how we're affecting the watershed. So anything that we see that happens, such as a farmer is using too much nitrogen to grow their crops and it's affecting the nitrates in the Deschutes watershed, we'll find that. Monitoring the health of our rivers is essential to preserve and restore our ecosystems. If we let all of, if we let there be too much water, we can have toxic algae blooms, which create, which suck all of the oxygen out of our water, which can kill a lot of our uh, organisms. Different bodies of water have different levels of pollution. The more we monitor them, we can prevent contamination problems. So some people have probably heard of a watershed, but it's kind of a hard thing to define. So a watershed is defined by the high points like hills or mountains. And a watershed is named after the largest bodies of water in it, like a river, lake, or a bay. So when we do our water quality testing, we test in the Deschutes watershed, which is named after the Deschutes River. And that's the largest body of water there besides the Puget Sound. Here is an example of a watershed. There's the high points, which are also known as divides. And then there's the valley, which has the rivers and the tributaries. Um, one important thing to note is that a watershed ju isn't just the water. It's also like the land and everything in that area. Watersheds are important for humans and animals. They're very important to have a healthy economy, which provide, since they provide clean water for industrial use and irrigation. We also depend on them for recreation and clean drinking water. And wildlife need a healthy watershed to live in and So we measured dissolved oxygen, temperature, fecal coliform, pH, nitrates, turbidity, benthic macroinvertebrates, and physical features of the riparian zone. Here's a map of the Deschutes watershed. At the headwaters, it's Gifford Pinchot National Forest. It flows into Capitol Lake. Its mouth is at Bud Inlet. Our site is located two miles from the mouth of the Deschutes River. A stream site survey is when we look at the river itself and the area of land around it. So we look at the depths of the river, the width, the clarity of the water, what the bottom of the stream looks like. Is it silty or muddy or gravelly? What kind of trees are around the river? Are there coniferous trees, deciduous trees? What kind of like small shrubs or grasses are around there? And then how far are the trees from the river? Or how much shade is the river getting? We also look at what kind of um, pavement and just general development is around it, because that can really affect what kind of runoff goes into the water.
Ian, you're muted. Dissolve oxygen measures the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in the water. It is very important for healthy rivers and ecosystems. It, the level of dissolved oxygen, it can help explain what species can survive in the water. And fish and aquatic insects take oxygen through their gills, which can only be found in dissolved oxygen. And it is measured in milligrams per liter. Dissolved, dissolved oxygen, as Ian said, it's it's the amount of oxygen that is that has become dissolved into the water by producers, uh, any any like water producers that you can think of. It water dissolved oxygen. It's a very complicated and it's a very complicated process to measure with using about five or six different chemicals. When we measured at our, our testing site on the Deschutes River, we wanted to find nine milligrams per liter. And in October, we found 10.65 as an average over four tests. This is really good water quality and it'd be perfect for any habitat. On, in February, we also found a really good measurement of 9.7. Five, and we we met we got anything from ten point five to nine point five. So we still have a really good level of dissolved oxygen in February. Okay, temperature affects many of the physical, biological, and chemical characteristics of a river or body of water, such as dissolved oxygen, aquatic plants, and the met metabolic rate of aquatic organisms. Also, colder water means the dissolved oxygen will be higher. So um, the optimal level is less than 12 degrees Celsius. Um, and in October 2021, it was at 10 degrees, which is pretty good. And in February 2022, it was 9 degrees. pH stands for potential hydrogen. Water, H2O, contains both hydrogen ion, or positive hydrogen ions and hydraulics, hydro, hydrolo, hydraulicsy ions. Oh, the pH test measures the positive hydrogen ion concentration of liquids. Most organisms are adapted to live in a specific pH range and are sensitive to change. If something happened to uh, if something happened to a ecosystem, for example, if the pH rate uh, even went up by one, it would it would uh, it would devastate the ecosystem because of how the scale is. Every time you go up one, it's ten, it's ten times the amount that was previously there. We measure pH on a scale that ranges from zero to 14. The lower the value, the more acidic, like one of the highest is battery acid, which can burn your skin. The lower the value, the more alkaline or basic. Right in the middle is seven, which is good water quality. A little bit, about 7.5 is ocean water and about five is milk. I mean, I'm sorry, not five. Uh, 6.5 is salt water and around uh, 8.5 is milk. The salt water is going to be more like 8 to 8.5, right? Yes. When we measured pH at our testing site, we got seven pH units in October and then seven pH units again in February. This is perfect and exactly what we wanted. Nitrogen is a very important element for all living plants and animals, which they use to create proteins. It makes up about 80% of the air that we breathe. It can be absorbed by algae 
and converted into forms of nitrogen, such as ammonia and nitrates, which can cause algae blooms and eutrophication. And they are measured in milligrams per liter. In October of 2021, we, our level was 1.75 milligrams per liter. And in February of 2022, it was one milligram per liter. The optimal levels are below one milligram per liter. Turbidity. Turbidity is a test that we do in order to measure the clarity of the water or how clear the water is. The higher the turbidity level, the murkier the water is and the more stressful it is for salmon to live here. The higher the level of turbidity in the water, the warmer the water is and the less dissolved oxygen there is. Turbidity affects the temperature of the water because the darker the water is, the more solar energy it absorbs. Turbidity is increased by soil erosion, in industrial waste, sewage, and we measure turbidity using JTUs, which stands for Jackson Turbidity Units. All right, so this is um, the picture above is when we did water quality testing two to three years ago. And so we got on October 22nd, 2019, we got 0 0.875 JTUs. And then in uh, February 18th, 2022, we got zero JTUs. So the optimal level is less than one JTU. So this was about right. Um, another unit of measuring for turbidity is NTU, which stands for nephilometric turbidity units. Although, like I said, we use JTUs. Fecal coliform is a type of bacteria that is found in the feces of humans and other warm-blooded animals. It occurs naturally in the digestive tracts of warm-blooded animals and aids in the digestion of food. It comes from sources of fecal coliform in water are from the discharge of waste from animals like dogs, deer, or other creatures that are around there. Um, agricultural runoff, sewage, and poorly ma maintained septic systems, and they are measured in colonies per 100 milliliters. We did not collect that on fecal coliform. What are benthic macroinvertebrates? Benthic means bottom dwelling, which refers to an organism rever refers to an organism that lives and attaches themselves to the bottom of a riverbed, such as how the caddis fly makes itself a cocoon out of uh, silt and small pebbles, and then uses its legs to attach itself to a larger rock so it can hold on and find food. Macro means visible to the naked eye, so you can see these creatures without having to use a microscope. Invertebrate means without a backbone. So all BMIs don't have a backbone. BMIs can help us determine how healthy a river, a river is without any expensive chemical or testing equipment. For example, if you find a bunch of leeches and in a river, it's not gonna be that healthy. But if you find stone flies and caddis flies and mayflies, you know that this river is a good uh, habitat. We measure BMIs with a pollution tolerance index, the PTI. When we collected data for benthic macroinvertebrates, in October we got a score of 22 indicating good water quality and it's right on the edge of having excellent water quality. In February we got a 20 indicating also good water quality but a little less than October. But all, all of our measurements tend to influx during the time before, between October and February. Hotspots are tests that did not meet the standards. We think our site didn't meet the standards because of factors such as the Tumwater Valley Golf Course using fertilizers to keep their grass green. 
All of the fertilizers wash straight into the Deschutes River, causing lots of algae blooms and eutrophication. The algae sucks up all the oxygen in the stream. In the stream. That's why we think our dissolved oxygen levels are low. That's also why nitrates and fecal coliform, coliform levels are high. Animal feces from residential areas near our stream may also play a factor. We think the temperature was a hot spot in the fall because the summer drought caused low water levels, which enabled the sun to shine directly on what little water was in the river, which therefore made the temperature higher. While we were at the site, we had some couple questions about our water quality testing. Like, is the old Olympic brewery affecting the water quality? Are the fertilizers from the golf course affecting the nitrate levels? Is the sewage pipe under the bridge affecting the water quality? And is it safe to float a boat from Pioneer Park to our study site? Some improvements we can make to our site are to have more trash can, more dog waste units. We could talk to the Tumwater Valley Golf Course about their use of fertilizers plant more trees and maintain and check sewage systems for leaks and restore Capital Lake to an estuary. Be a watershed hero. Some things you can do are go and explore your watershed. There are lots of trails and other recreational activities. You can also learn about your watershed, inform yourself, teach your friends and family about your watershed and last, enjoy your watershed. Next, we have some of our efforts to, ref to restore our watershed. So like we mentioned earlier, we're part of a science program uh, and we've been working with Ole Ecosystems for a while now so that we can restore the hillside along West Bay Drive. The last time we went to West Bay Woods, we planted over 400 native plants. West Bay Woods is a new park that has not opened yet. It's important because the plants we plant there help filter stormwater runoff before they can reach Mud Bay. Redwoods at Monroe Meadows. We, we plant coastal redwoods. We, well, we've been planting coastal redwoods because they're not only the tallest living thing, but they're also amazing at absorbing CO2 through sequestration. They're resilient and fast growing trees. They're fascinating and grow to humongous, humongous uh, sizes and they're beautiful. Thus, we are working with partners to plant a grove of redwood trees along the Evergreen Parkway in the Monroe Meadows. Grass Lake is only a short walk from our school, and we've been working there to create a trailhead on 14th Avenue and to improve existing hiking trails and remove invasive plants like Himalayan blackberry and scotch broom and plant more tree native trees and plants. In conclusion, Water quality monitoring is important because it helps students stay connected to their watersheds and it teaches them about citizen science. It also helps us be aware of what our watershed needs. One of the best ways you can help out your watershed is to plant native plants so that they can prevent stormwater runoff and so they can sequester carbon. Are there any questions? Thank you, Marshall Middle School students. That was great. Um, we're gonna save questions for the end once everyone has presented. Uh, it's pretty cool to see you guys studying the watershed and looking at the macro invertebrates because I did that in college. So it's a great running start to see our youth doing that as well. I'm now going to turn our presentation over to South Sound Green to talk more about the Student Green Congress.
Well, um, thanks, Clarissa. That was just uh, amazing. Nice job, Marshall. You guys did such an awesome job of doing water testing this year and explaining in very like lots of detail about all the steps that are involved. Um, we've been working like uh, Matthew Philippi said with Marshall for well, the last seven years as CSI, but then before that um, for quite a while. And this program, South Sound uh, Global Rivers Environmental Education Network has been active in Thurston County for uh, 30 years. Um, and we work with a variety of schools in a variety of different areas throughout the county. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so we live in such a special place. Um, we're kind of sandwiched between the Olympic Mountains um, and the Cascade Range with Mount Tahoma visible on those clear days. And Puget Sound is kind of nestled right down here in the middle. Um, and like you heard the Marshall students talking about, um, Puget Sound has, there are some challenges with um, thinking about how our watersheds, uh, when it rains, any pollutants that are on the ground potentially can end up here. So um, while it's a beautiful place, there are some sort of hidden uh, pollution problems. And so we are working hard to educate students and the community about that so that we can make a difference and keep this place really beautiful. At the heart of a lot of the work that we do in this water, water quality testing, um, it gets back to salmon. Um, so we are looking at these charismatic megafauna as a way to sort of draw people in to this issue of water quality. Um, we know that our resident uh, killer whales rely on Chinook salmon for their survival predominantly. Um, and if our habitat is not clean in the freshwater system, if that water quality is poor, um, it's going to not allow those runs to be healthy. And so it's, it is a struggle to, you know, I think that that is definitely something that's been in the news and there's a variety of reasons why salmon are struggling. Um, and the more that we can do to educate our community about uh, these water quality issues, the again, the more actions that we can take. So I mentioned that uh, this program has been active for 30 years. It was actually brought into the Thurston County region um, by a former um, a car dealership, uh, um, Hulbert Auto, actually brought this back from a, a General Motors um, meeting in Michigan, which is where the green program actually started. Um, and so quickly spread throughout this region, got a lot of support from um, not only the school districts, but from the local jurisdictions, the city of Tumwater, Olympia, Lacey, and Thurston County. They all jumped on board right away because they saw this as a way to really um, you know, improve our watersheds. And so um, this program then split into some subgroups. And so we had the Bud Deschutes Green and we had the um, Nisqually uh, River Education Project. And now there's even, there's a third watershed program too in the Chehalis Basin called the Chehalis uh, Basin Education Consortium. And so we call our, we're kind of like the three uh, sister watershed programs here in uh, Thurston County. You can go to the next one. Um, here's a picture of the watersheds in Thurston County. You heard the kiddos talking about the Bud Deschutes, which is you can kind of see is there right in the middle. Um, and then we also work in the other sub basins that drain to Puget Sound. Um, so working left to right, it, that would be um, Totten Inlet and Totten Watershed and Eld. Um, Deschutes is in the middle there, and then we've got the Henderson over to the right. Um, and I mentioned that the Nisqually River is um, served by the Nisqually River Education Project, so that's the far right watershed, and then the southernmost watersheds all drain to the Chehalis River and then out to um, Puget Sound. I'll pass it over to Sam. He's going to tell you about some of our programs. Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Nadell. I am the South Sound Green Program Coordinator at the uh, Thurston Conservation District. I've been with the program in the district for about uh, two and a half years and I'm gonna go through a little bit about what we uh, do at South Sound Green throughout the year. So like you just heard these Marshall Middle School students talk about, 
Our big program is water quality testing. Uh, in a normal year, we might have over 60 different water quality test sites throughout that area that Stephanie described uh, in those watersheds within Thurston County that drain into Puget Sound. And these sites are tested by students at the elementary, middle, high school, and uh, even sometimes college level. And these students across the board are doing those same tests that the Marshall Middle School students were doing, uh, focusing on dissolved oxygen, nitrates, pH, turbidity, temperature. Uh, we can test things like fecal coliform as well. And we have been doing this program for, we're in our, uh, I believe 2022 is going to be our 30th uh, anniversary of the start of the program. And so uh, we have data sets running back to the, the early to mid 90s, uh, which is pretty incredible to have a citizen science project providing uh, fairly reliable data for uh, this long with, you know, testing at uh, two time periods throughout the year, every year. And so we've had some of our teachers and schools participate for, for decades at this point, or we have some teachers who are brand new to the program on in any given year. So uh, this is a very cool program. Students are doing real uh, chemical water quality tests. They are given gloves and goggles, and they are not only learning the water quality side of it, but they are learning the hands-on water quality testing component, learning how to use a pipette and, you know, measure a sample in milliliters and, uh, you know, clean up and, and make sure things end up in waste containers and, and doing, doing it all safely is, is uh, what we have found to be like really big aspects of the program, even though it is not our uh, primary goal in, in, in leading it. So uh, water quality testing reaches uh, over a thousand students every year within Thurston County and uh, is definitely our biggest program, has taken a bit of a turn during COVID, but we are uh, coming back into uh, some more normal water quality testing and programs like Marshall Middle School are uh, leading the charge with getting back and doing uh, in-person field trips to do this. So as uh, Matthew mentioned at the beginning of the uh, session, we have a big event every year called Student Green Congress. This is an event for student delegates from our schools who participate in water quality testing to come to Evergreen State College uh, in uh, March to meet up with their peers and actually present that their data from that year. And so this is, you know, a an opportunity for for fifth graders and middle school students to uh, present original research and talk to other students who have done their own data collection and actually compare within their specific watershed uh, results and you know ideas for potentially improving water quality overall in, uh, in South Puget Sound. Student Green Congress also includes things like keynote speakers, uh, workshops, and as you can see here, student MCs, because we want to really, you know, put it in the hands of the students, have the students be leading the charge and, you know, leading the event. As Matthew mentioned as well, we have uh, had not had an in-person Student Green Congress in a few years at this point. Last year, we had our first ever virtual Student Green Congress with a a story map version of our typical state of the rivers uh, water quality data event. We had virtual workshops offered by a variety of community partners uh, where we personally delivered those materials to the schools and then everyone set up their own uh, almost like private or just two or three classes uh, attending a specific workshop. And we had a keynote speaker as well as, as well uh, as our conclusion of the event. This year, we're doing virtual Student Green Congress for hopefully the last time. And we instead, uh, you know, built upon what we uh, developed last year. So we now have even more community partners offering workshops. We have a really amazing keynote presentation from Long Live the Kings and all of that is going to be taking place 
in mid-March, March 17th this year. And we have the rare opportunity because it's a virtual event to be able to offer it to entire classes instead of just student delegates. So we have uh, even more participation than a normal Student Green Congress uh, with students coming from our watershed, the Nisqually watershed and the Chehalis Basin Education Consortium. So outside of our water quality testing, we offer a lot of support with things like service learning and action projects. So for the like uh, the Redwoods planting that Marshall Middle School did back in January, we were on hand to, to assist with that, but we do other restoration projects uh, throughout the county as well. And we support classes as they take on their own action projects. So sometimes these action projects come out of Student Green Congress where they've identified a particular hotspot and want to do a specific action to address it. Sometimes it comes from students who have been inspired by doing water quality testing within their class and, and want to make a difference. So a recent example is students at the Olympia Regional Learning Academy or Orla organizing their own trash cleanups during their recess times because students recognized that when they went water quality testing, they saw a lot of pollution at their site. And so these are, you know, opportunities to build upon the uh, water quality testing, but uh, to do so with more uh, direct actions. Another offering we uh, provide at South Sound Green are nearshore field trips. These typically take place in the uh, spring and early summer every year. These are opportunities for students to, uh, instead of focusing just on the freshwater, get exposed to the saltwater aspects of Thurston County as well. And so we like to bring students to local beaches or local docks or marinas to provide a you know, comprehensive lesson that includes things like intertidal zone biology, um, uh, you know, potentially water quality testing of uh, saltwater environments. We like to have a diver on hand to go dive and collect specimens uh, from the, uh, the seafloor. And so these are, you know, another opportunity to get students out in the field and see a different aspect of the watershed. So we have water quality program that is, you know, based in October and February, where their students are seeing how water is flowing uh, through their local rivers and creeks. And then in the spring, towards the end of their school year, they get to take these field trips to see where that water ends up in Puget Sound. We have a lot of uh, school district partners and I think I might pass it to Stephanie to expand on that. Sure, I'll take, sure. Um, yeah, so we do, we, we work with a variety of school districts uh, throughout Thurston County. Um, including North Thurston Public Schools, uh, Olympia School District, Griffin School District, uh, Tumwater School District, and Rainier School District, as well as um, private and homeschool groups. So um, without those partners and, and, you know, sometimes working closely with the district administration and closely with um, teacher teams, our program wouldn't be as strong as it is. So we're really grateful for those connections that we've made within the school districts. Uh, we work hard to nurture teachers. I think that's something that is really at the top of the list uh, in some of the work that we do. If, if we can educate teachers and helping them to feel confident about bringing students outside, um, then uh, that just it, it just grows exponentially. Every year you're bringing another classroom of students down to the creek or bringing another group of students out to the beach. Um, so we do have variety of uh, professional development offerings throughout the school year and even over the summer um, to engage teachers in this type of learning. One of our uh, kind of, I would say most favorite, I, it, it is though, um, and probably one of our largest professional development opportunities is Summer Institute for Teachers. This, um, this occurs three days over three day period just after school is out. Um, and over the three days, we, we have a different theme every year. Um, this professional development is done in partnership again with the Nisqually River Education Project and the Chehalis Basin Education Consortium. Um, and these three watershed groups come together to identify a theme, 
to identify some um, really rich um, outdoor field experiences that engage teachers in like the, the just again the beauty of this place that we're living in and um, sort of reinvigorate them in thinking about science in a really creative and fun way. Um, and then we incorporate uh, grade level appropriate lessons related to that theme and that field experience. Um, so for example, um, one year we were focused on uh, glaciers and um, glacier uh, receding glaciers on Mount Rainier. So we went up to Mount Rainier and we spent a night at Pack Forest and we spoke with um, Mount Rainier Rangers and we talked about how, how the ice is formed on the mountain. And then we sort of traced the watershed all the way down to the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge and um, engaged in some lessons down there as well. Um, so for the last, I would say at least 10 years, our themes have focused on climate change, um, how climate change is affecting our really high, in a hyper-local way, how it's affecting Thurston County. And so themes like uh, receding glaciers, sea level rise, ocean acidification, um, those are uh, like water quantity. Those are things that we are uh, talking about at Summer Institute for Teachers. Um, you know, Sam touched on, I think a little bit of our action projects. Uh, we, we really rely heavily on volunteers as well. Um, the more hands on deck, the easier those, uh, those field experiences go with students, um, especially like planting projects like this, if we can break into smaller groups. Um, and have uh, adults there to help out. Um, it's it's just makes everything go much more smoothly. Um, so if anybody is interested in volunteering with us, we would love to have your help. Um, yeah, and here's our contact information. We have um, a website with, you know, Sam re referred to our uh, data set. All of our data is available on our website. We have um, at home lessons there. We have links to videos that we've created over the last couple of years, especially the story map for the Student Green Congress will be posted there. Um, and then we have, you know, social media, of course. So if you'd like to follow us and see what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you can find us there as well. Yeah, and I think that's all we have. Thank you, Sam and Stephanie. That was fascinating. I have lived here for a couple of years, had heard about South Sound Green, but never dove into it. So that was a pretty cool presentation. Uh, I hope a lot of people watching are now interested in them as well. Go check out their website, check out their volunteering. So now we will open up to questions. Um, so if you have any questions, type those in the chat. And if everyone wants to turn on their cameras, we can get started because they're already rolling in. To get started, I do want to ask the Marshall Middle School students, what was your favorite part about water quality testing? Was it out in the field? Was it looking at research? Was it macroinvertebrates? I really, I really enjoyed learning about macroinvertebrates and then looking through our samples and identifying different, uh, different invertebrates. Um, I really enjoyed doing the turbidity test. It's kind of cool to see, like, um, you add a chemical to the water to make it, um, like, you have to figure out how to. I'm trying to say this. Um, doing the turbidity test, that was my favorite part, or the hike afterward. I also like the turbidity test. It was really interesting to see how long it would take because it differs each time with the amount that you have to put in. So it's very fun. Yeah, I like the turbidity test too, but I also just liked like going to like Tumbler Falls and like seeing the site and like we went there in sixth grade, so it was kind of cool to see how it was different when we went back in eighth grade. So yeah, that was great. That is cool to see it changing over time. Okay, one of our questions are, 
is um, are the redwoods native trees? And then which of the suggestions for your site do you think would have the most impact on the health of the river? Which of the water quality aspects did you find most interesting? Oh, you got that one. Uh, did you see salmon this year? And um, how was present or presenting for us? Was it exciting? Was it nerve wracking? All right, um, I can take the redwood question first. So um, redwoods technically aren't native here, but with the changing climate, they have, um, they're better suited for living here than in other places. Could you? To answer the question about if we saw salmon, we saw quite a few salmon this year. There were a lot of them in the Trinity Creek where we went. It was really cool to watch them. There were a couple of times involved too, but not not a ton, but there definitely were some that we saw. In the other group though, we went in February, we didn't see any salmon. Only the October group did. What were the other questions? Um, which of the suggestions for your site do you think would have the most impact on the river? Was it the, um, the fertilizers? Was it, um, I can't remember what the other ones were. Do you want to reinstate re <laughs> those ones? I personally think probably if they stop using fertilizers at the golf course, that would probably be the biggest impact. Um, and maybe go pick up the dog's poop too. That probably helps. Uh, suggestion of restoring Capital Lake into yeah, a Yeah, I agree. Forest. I think it'd be the fertilizer. I think I, I think it would also be restoring Capital Lake as well. And then um, Someone mentioned if there was ever thought of testing um, before the golf course and after to see if there was a change in that nitrogen. That's a really good idea. I think that we could we could also we could do that and then we could also test like places where the contraband could be entering. Like we could try to find the source and then either block it or just like not use as much fertilizer. I think one of the cool things about Green Congress is these kids would be in a breakout session with kids from other schools that are on the same watershed. So they'd be able to look at that data, like the group that was upstream of, you know, the golf course and compare it. And that's one of the coolest things like with Stephanie and Sam, what they put together with these kids from all these different schools, they get to compare and analyze the data. And the way that these uh, South Sound Green folks facilitate these workshops for the kids, it's pretty amazing because uh, like Clarissa was saying with BMIs, like I didn't start doing this stuff till I was in college. And so to see like junior high kids doing this stuff, it's pretty phenomenal. It gives me as a teacher a lot of hope for the future that the stuff you're trying to teach, you know that these kids are going to take it and run with it. So that gives us a lot of hope. Another question we have for Sam and Stephanie is what inspired you to get involved in environmental education? A little philosophical there. <laughs> uh, so let's see, I'll, I'll take it. I uh, was interested in environmental science at a very young age. My father is a high school earth science teacher. And so a lot of my off time was, you know, as a child was, was spent like going to science museums and taking hikes and attending like nature summer camps. And so I have had an interest in, in the environment for a while and got more interested in environmental education uh, a little bit after college. I did uh, a few uh, seasonal environmental education jobs, uh, different places throughout the country. 
specifically aboard uh, educational uh, tall ships or boats. So had an opportunity to actually be out on the water and be out outside and in the field. And that led to this where I could, you know, be based on land, but still be able to visit water and, and be out in the field with students. And I had sort of uh, some similarities there. I don't know if you've anybody's read Richard Lou's, um, uh No Child Left Inside, um, but he refers to how there's such a strong connection with um, being like growing up outside and having a lot of time outdoors. Um, and so I grew up in upstate New York on in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> we had just acres of forest and creeks and we that's where we grew up and that's where we played. and. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of, you know, we had three channels on the television. So it was our main thing was be going outside. Um, and then I uh, kind of took some classes in college. I didn't really know that environmental education was um, a, a specific, really a, a job or a career path that I could take uh, until I moved to Washington State. And um, I started working at the Mason Conservation District. Um, got started with uh, some environmental education programs there. And then I moved over to the Thurston Conservation District um, in 2012. So I've been here uh, in this role for about 10 years now. And it's great. Every day, every time we go out with kids, every time we go out to the river to collect samples, uh, we see something new, we learn something new. It never gets old. It's, it's super great. So um, another question that I just have for Stephanie and Sam is, what is the next event that volunteers can help out with? I can jump in. So our next big Thurston Conservation District event is uh, the Native Plant Sale, which is this Saturday. Uh, it is an event at Thurston County Fairgrounds. It is an event that happens every year, but we didn't we weren't able to do it in person last year. And there, besides native plants available for sale, there are a lot of community partners and booths and uh, food, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. And that is, I believe, 10 to three on this Saturday. Uh, volunteers, I think we have two time slots. I think it's like a nine to 12 and a one to four maybe. And that registration is is available on the Thurston Conservation District website, thurstoncd.com. Uh, it is also an opportunity for our uh, high school volunteer group, Teens in Thurston, or TNT, to participate in a volunteer event. Uh, this is a relatively new volunteer group at the Conservation District that is specifically for high schoolers in Thurston County. We have a and some sort of event every month as a group to do something to either you know uh, promote uh, conservation or you know take on take actions to to improve our environment. So that has looked like uh, restoration projects at Watershed Park or uh, touring the Kennedy Creek Salmon Trail and doing some trash cleanup or uh, taking a garden tour at uh, Avanti High School and uh, helping prepare their garden for the spring. And so if you are a high school student or you know a high school student who would be interested in that, that uh, information is also available on our uh, Thurston Conservation District website and uh, events are you know once a month. And so next one is Saturday and one after that will be sometime in April. So yeah, restore your watershed, buy some native plants. Sounds like a good, good timing there. Another question for our um, middle school students is, when is your next testing and what do you think it will look like? Will it be better? Will it be worse? What are your thoughts? Um, well, I think we only usually do two tests every year and we just did our second test. So our next test will probably be next year. I'm guessing that the temperature of the water will probably be a little warmer next year and the turbidity will be a little uh, too high. That's my guess.
Jay, Jonah, or Ian, do you have any thoughts on that? I I think there'd be like as Haley was saying, the temperature would be warmer because the of the summer heat. I also think there would be salmon again when we test in October, and that'd be cool to see. And then uh, next time, I bet there's going to be a lot less mayflies because the hatch is different. Because we found a lot of mayflies when we were uh, recording BMIs. I agree that there will probably be a temperature rise and maybe some effect will be caused by the golf course fertilizers. Jade, do you have anything to add to that? No, just the same. Yeah, so we, and hopefully it's not, right? We're, we're hoping that the weather doesn't just keep these hot, hot summers and that we have some uh, more mayflies in our waters to help feed those baby salmon as they come through. My hope for that testing site we have is pretty high because we've seen over the seven years we've been testing there, that park has gone through a lot of restoration. They have a a new fish hatchery there with a really cool viewing windows for the public to see. Uh, go in September, that's the best time to go see the Chinooks. Uh, Lee's an awesome fish hatchery manager down there. Um, but then also they've done a really good job with the native plant garden down there. And they finally have connected the trails there at Tum Waterfalls Park to the Tum Water Historical Park down below. And there's new playground equipment for the kids. Um, you know, we talk about when we go to our site, we always go and hike down to the falls and we talk about this is kind of the birthplace of this community right here, uh, as far as our contemporary society goes. And of course, you know, the indigenous cultures here have been there at the falls in this area for time immemorial. But we would love to see like the old brewery site. I'm talking about like not the brick and mortar one. That one's really cool. We'd love to see that restored and maybe turn into like some local shops, restaurants, uh, get the community using that again. But like the Kind of the newer part of it the old yellow nasty part we'd love to see that gone and just see a really beautiful greenway riparian zones kind of cleaned up um so we we hope that you know with these students doing this stuff and raising more awareness around our community that this is a really awesome piece of land and the river should be like you know the cornerstone of this community along with bud bay and we need to do everything we can to like get the public using it instead of letting derelict buildings sit there and do nothing for our community or for our environment. So hopefully that can get restored in the future. Yeah, I drive by there and I remember during the really heavy rains we had that was just flooded all over there and all over the golf course. It was amazing to see. It was like, wow, all of that, all that stuff that lands there when we have these heavy rains just washes right into the river. So nice to bring awareness. If no one else has any other questions, you can type those into the chat. Um, we can also send them to our participants to answer at a later time. But thank you so much, um, Marshall Middle School and South Sound Green. That was a great presentation. Learn so much about what is happening here locally to test our waters rather than what's going on in the world. We're looking specifically here in Olympia to inspire our town to do what they can to help protect our water. So uh, I wanna thank all those listening as well for joining in. Our, uh, this is our last discovery speaker series for the sections that we have them in. They're October through March. And so this one is now over. Um, we will start back again in October this year, but we'll take a small break. So make sure that you uh, send us your coloring page if you enjoyed those and hope to see you in the following session. Thanks for joining. <laughs>